Good morning, friends. We're on chapter 10, Anne's Apology. Get out of the sun. Marilla said nothing to Matthew about the affair that evening, but when Anne proved still refractory the next morning, an explanation had to be made to account for her absence from the breakfast table. Marilla told Matthew the whole story, taking pains to impress him with a due sense of the enormity of Anne's behavior. It's a good thing Rachel Lynn got a calling down. She's a meddlesome old gossip, was Matthew's consolatory rejoinder. Matthew Cuthbert, I am astonished at you. You know that Anne's behavior was dreadful, and yet you take her part. I suppose you'll be saying next thing that she oughtn't to be punished at all. Well, now, no, not exactly, said Matthew uneasily. I reckon she ought to be punished a little. But don't be too hard on her, Marilla. Recollect she has never had anyone to teach her right. You're, you're going to give her something to eat, aren't you? When did you ever hear of me starving people into good behavior? demanded Marilla indignantly. indignantly. She'll have her meals regular, and I'll carry them up for her myself. But she'll stay up there until she's willing to apologize to Mrs. Lynde, and that's final, Matthew. Breakfast, dinner, and supper were very silent meals, for Anne still remain, remained obdurate. After each meal, Marilla carried a well-filled tray to the east gable and brought it down later on, not noticeably depleted. Matthew eyed its last... Matthew eyed its last descent with a troubled eye. Had Anne eaten anything at all? When Marilla went out that evening to bring the cows from the back pasture, Matthew, who had been hanging about the barns and watching, slipped into the house with the air of a burglar and crept upstairs. As a general thing, Matthew gravitated between the kitchen and the little bedroom off the hall where he slept. Once in a while, he ventured uncomfortably into the parlor or sitting room when, when the minister came to tea, but he had never been upstairs in his own house since the spring he helped Marilla paper the spare bedroom, and that was four years ago. He tiptoed along the hall and stood for several minutes outside the door of the east gable before he summoned courage to tap on it with his fingers and then open the door to peep in. Anne was sitting on the yellow chair by the window, gazing mournfully out into the garden. Very small and unhappy she looked, and Matthew's heart smote him. He softly closed the door and tiptoed over to her. Anne, he whispered, as if afraid of being overheard. How are you making it, Anne? Anne smiled wanly. Pretty well. I imagine a good deal, and that helps to pass the time. Of course, it's rather lonesome, but then I may as well get used to that. Anne smiled again, bravely facing the long years of solitary imprisonment before her. Matthew recollected that he must say what he had come to say without loss of time, lest Marilla return prematurely. "'Well now, Anne, don't you think you'd better do it and have it over with?' he whispered. "'It'll have to be done sooner or later, you know, for Marilla's a dreadful determined woman. "'Dreadful determined, Anne. Do it right off, I say, and have it over. "'Do you mean apologize to Mrs. Lynde?' "'Yes, apologize, that's the very word,' said Matthew eagerly. "'Just smooth it over, smooth it over, so to speak. That's what I was trying to get at. "'I suppose I could do it to oblige you,' said Anne thoughtfully. "'It would be true enough to say I am sorry, because I am sorry now.' I wasn't a bit sorry last night. I was mad clear through, and I stayed mad all night. I know I did, because I woke up three times, and I was just furious every time. But this morning it was all over. I wasn't in a temper any more, and it left a dreadful sort of goneness, too. I felt so ashamed of myself, but I just couldn't think of going and telling Mrs. Lynde so. It would be so humiliating. I made up my mind to say I'd shut up... I made up my mind... I'd stay shut up here forever rather than do that, but still I'd do anything for you if you really want me to. Well, now, of course I do. It's terrible lonesome downstairs without you. Just go and smooth it over. That's a good girl. Very well, said Anne resignedly. I'll tell Marilla as soon as she comes in that I've repented. That's right, that's right, Anne. But don't tell Marilla I said anything about it. She might think I was putting my oar in and promise, and I promise not to do that. Wild horses won't drag the secret from me, promised Anne solemnly. How would wild horses drag a, a secret from a person, anyhow? But Matthew was gone, scared at, it, at his own success. He fled hastily to the remotest corner of the house, of the horse pasture, lest Marilla should suspect what he had been up to. Marilla herself, upon her return to the house, was agreeably surprised to hear a plaintive voice calling, Marilla, over the banisters. Well, she said, going into the hall, I'm sorry I lost my temper and said rude things, and I'm willing to go and tell Mrs. Lynde so. Very well. Marilla's Christmas crispness gave no sign of her relief. She had been wondering what what under the canopy she she should do if Anne did not give in. I'll take you down after milking. Accordingly, after milking, behold, Marilla and Anne walked down the lane, the former erect and triumphant, the latter drooping and dejected. But halfway down... 
but halfway down Anne's dejection vanished as if by enchantment. She lifted her head and stepped lightly along, her eyes fixed on the sunset sky and an air of subdued exhilaration about her. Marilla beheld the change disapprovingly. There was no meek penitence. This was no meek penitent, such as it behooved her to take into the presence of the offended Mrs. Lynde. "'What are you thinking of, Anne?' she asked sharply. "'I'm imagining out what I must say to Mrs. Lynde,' answered Anne dreamily. This was satisfactory, or should have been so, but Marilla could not rid herself of the notion that something in her scheme of punishment was going askew. Anne had no business to look so rapt and radiant. Rapt and radiant, Anne continued until they were in the very presence of Mrs. Lynde, Lynde who was sitting knitting by her kitchen window. Then the radiance vanished. Mournful penitence appeared on every feature. Before a word was spoken, Anne suddenly went down on her knees before the astonished Mrs. Rachel and held out her hands beseechingly. "'Oh, Mrs. Lynde, I am so extremely sorry,' she said with a quiver in her voice. "'I could never express all my sorrow, no, not if I used up a whole dictionary. "'You must just imagine it. I behaved terribly to you, "'and I've disgraced the dear friends Matthew and Marilla, "'who have let me stay at Green Gables, although I'm not a boy. "'I'm a dreadfully wicked and ungrateful girl, "'and I deserve to be punished and cast out by respectable people forever. "'It was very wicked of me to fly into a temper because you told me the truth.' It was the truth. Every word you said was true. My hair is red, and I'm freckled and skinny and ugly. What you said was tr what I said was true, too, but I shouldn't have said it. Oh, Mrs. Lynde, please, please forgive me. If you refuse it, it will be a lifelong sorrow to me. You wouldn't like to inflict a lifelong sorrow on a poor little orphan girl, would you? Even if she had a dreadful temper? Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't. Please say you forgive me, Mrs. Lynde. Anne clasped her hands together, bowed her head, and waited for the word of judgment. There was no mistaking her sincerity. It breathed in every tone of her voice. Both Marilla and Mrs. Lynde recognized its unmistakable ring, but the former understood in dismay that Anne was actually enjoying her valley of humiliation, was reveling in the thoroughness of her abasement. Where was the wholesome punishment upon which she, Marilla, had plumed herself? Anne had turned it into a species of positive pleasure. Good Mrs. Lynde, not being overburdened with perception, did not see this. She only perceived that Anne had made a very thorough apology in all resentment, vanished from her kindly, if somewhat officious heart. "'There, there, get up, child,' she said heartily. "'Of course I forgive you. I guess I was a little hard on you anyway. But I'm such an outspoken person. You mustn't mind me, that's what. I can't. It can't be denied that your hair is terrible red, but I knew a girl once, went to school with her, in fact, whose hair was every mind as red as yours when she was young. But when she grew up, it darkened to a real handsome auburn. I wouldn't be a mite surprised if yours did, too. Not a mite.' "'Oh, Mrs. Lynde!' Anne drew a long breath as she rose to her feet. You have given me a hope. I shall always feel that you are a benefactor. Oh, I could endure anything if only I thought my hair would be a handsome auburn when I grew up. It would be so much easier to be good if one's hair was a handsome auburn, don't you think? And now may I go out into your garden and sit on that bench under the apple trees while you and Marilla are talking. There is so much more scope for the imagination out there. Laws, yes, run along, child, and you can pick a bouquet of those... White June lilies over in the corner, if you like. As the door closed behind Anne, Mrs. Lynde got briskly up to light a lamp. She's a real odd little thing. Take this chair, Marilla. It's easier than the one you've got. I just keep that for the hired boy to sit on. Yes, she certainly is an odd child, but there is something kind of taking about her after all. I don't feel so surprised at you and Matthew keeping her as I did, nor so sorry for you either. She may turn out all right. Of course, she has a queer way of expressing herself, a little too... Well, too kind of forcible, you know, but she'll likely get over that now that she's coming to live among civilized folks. And then her temper's pretty quick, I guess. But there's one comfort, a child that has a quick temper, just blaze up and cool down. Ain't never likely to be sly or deceitful. Preser preserve me from a sly child, that's what. On the whole, Marilla, I kind of like her. When Marilla went home, Anne came out of the fragrant twilight of the orchard with a sheaf of white narcissi in her hands. I apologized pretty well, didn't I? She said proudly as they went down the lane. I thought since I had to do it, I might as well do it thoroughly. You did it thoroughly all right enough, was Marilla's comment. Marilla was dismayed at finding herself inclined to laugh over the whole recollection. She had also an uneasy feeling that she ought to scold Anne for apologizing so well, but then that was ridiculous. She compromised with her conscience by saying severely, I hope you won't have occasion to make many more such apologies. I hope you'll try to control your temper now, Anne. That wouldn't be so hard if people wouldn't twit me about my looks. 
said Anne with a sigh. I don't get cross about other things, but I am so tired of being twitted about my hair, and it just makes me boil right over. Do you suppose my hair will really be a handsome auburn when I grow up? You shouldn't think so much about your looks, Anne. I'm afraid you are a very vain little girl. How can I be vain when I know I'm homely? protested Anne. I love pretty things, and I hate to look in the glass and see something that isn't pretty. It makes me feel so sorrowful, just as I feel when I look at an ugly thing. I pity it because it isn't beautiful. Handsome is as handsome does. <laughs> as handsome does, quoted Marilla. I've had that said to me before, but I have doubts about it, remarked skeptical Anne, sniffing at her narcissi. Oh, aren't these flowers sweet? It was lovely of Mrs. Lynde to give them to me. I have no hard feelings against Mrs. Lynde now. It gives you a lovely, comfortable feeling to apologize and be forgiven, doesn't it? Aren't the stars bright tonight? If you could live in a star, which one would you pick? I'd like that lovely, clear, big one over there, above that dark hill. And do hold your tongue, said Marilla, thoroughly worn out, trying to follow the gyrations of Anne's thoughts. Anne said no more until they turned into their own lane. A little gypsy wind came down to meet them, laden with the spicy perfume of young dew-wet ferns. Far up in the shadows, a cheerful light gleamed out through the trees from the kitchen at Green Gables. Anne suddenly came close to Marilla and slipped her hand into the older woman's hard palm. It's lovely to be going home and, and know it's home, she said. I love Green Gables already, and I've never loved any place before. No place ever seemed like home. Oh, Marilla, I'm so happy. I could pray right now and not find it a bit hard. Something warm and pleasant welled up in Marilla's heart at the touch of that thin little, thin little hand in her own. A throb of the maternity she had missed, perhaps. Its very unaccustomedness and sweetness disturbed her. She hastened to restore her sensations to their normal calm by in inculcating a moral. If you'll be a good girl, you'll always be happy, Anne, and you should never find it hard to say your prayers. Sayings one saying one's prayers isn't exactly the same thing as praying, said Anne meditatively. But I'm going to imagine that I'm the wind that is blowing up there in those treetops. When I get tired of the trees, I'll imagine I'm gently waving down here in the ferns, and then I'll fly over to Mrs. Lynde's gardens and garden and set the flowers dancing, and then I'll go with one great swoop over the clover field, and then I'll blow over the lake of shining wa waters and ripple it, ripple it all up into little sparkling waves. Oh, there's so much scope for the imagination in a wind, so I'll not talk any more just now, Marilla. Thank be goodness for that, breathed Marilla in devout relief. Chapter 11. Anne's Impression of Sunday School. Well, how do you like them, said Marilla. Anne was standing in the green gable looking solemnly at three new dresses spread out on the bed. One was of snuffy-colored gingham, which Marilla had been tempted to buy from a peddler the preceding summer because it looked so serviceable. One was of black-and-white checked sateen, which she had picked up at a bargain counter in the winter, and one was a stiff print of an ugly blue shade which she had purchased that week at a Carmody store. She had made them herself, and they were all made alike, plain skirts full, fold tightly to plain waists with sleeves as plain as waist and skirt and tight as sleeves could be. I'll imagine I like them, said Anne soberly. I don't want you to imagine it, said Marilla, offended. Oh, I can't, I can see you don't like the dresses. What's the matter with them? Aren't they neat and clean and new? Yes, then why don't you like them? They're, they're not pretty, Anne said reluctantly. Pretty, Marilla sniffed. I didn't trouble my head about getting pretty dresses for you. I don't believe in pampering vanity, Anne. I'll tell you right off, those dresses are good, sensible, serv serviceable dresses without any frills or furblows about them, and they'll all you'll get this summer. The brown gingham and the blue print will do for your school when you begin to go. The sateen is for church and Sunday school. I'll expect you to keep them neat and clean and not to tear them. I should think you'd be grateful to get most anything after those skimpy, wincy things you've been wearing. Oh, I am grateful, protested Anne, but I'd be ever so much more grateful or if if you've made just one with puff sleeves puff sleeves are so fashionable now it would give me such a thrill marilla just to wear a dress with puffed sleeves well you'll have to do without your thrill i hadn't any material to waste on puff sleeves i think they are ridiculous looking things anyhow i prefer the plain sensible ones but i'd rather look ridiculous when everybody else does than plain and sensible all by myself persisted anne mournfully trust you for that well hang those dresses carefully in your closet and then sit down and learn the sunday school lesson I got a quarterly for Mr. Bell for you, and you'll go to Sunday school tomorrow, said Marilla, disappearing downstairs in high dudgeon. Anne clasped her hands and looked at the dresses. I did hope there would be a white one with puff sleeves, she whispered disconsolately. 
have prayed for one, but I didn't much expect it on that account. I didn't suppose God would have time to bother about a little orphan girl's dress. I knew. I knew I'd have just... I knew I'd just have to depend on Marilla for it. Well, fortunately, I can imagine that one of them is Snow White Muslin with lovely lace frills and three puff sleeves. The next morning, warnings of a sick headache prevented Mar Marilla from going to Sunday school with Anne. You'll have to go down and call for Mrs. Lindan, she said. She'll see that you get into the right class. Now mind you behave yourself properly. Stay to preaching afterwards and ask Mrs. Lynde to show you, your, show you our pew. Here's a cent for collection. Don't, don't stare at people and don't fidget. I shall expect you to tell the text when you come home. Anne started off irreproachably, arrayed in the stiff black and white sateen, which, while decent as regards length and certainly not open to the charge of skimpiness, contrived its, contrived to emphasize every corner and angle of her thin figure. Her hat was a little, flat, glossy new sailor, the extreme plainness of which had likewise much disappointed Anne, who had permitted herself secret visions of ribbons and flowers. The latter, however, were supplied before Anne reached the main road, for being confronted halfway down the lane with a golden frenzy of wind-stirred buttercups and a glory of wild roses, and promptly and liberally garlanded her hat with a heavy wreath of them. Whatever other people might have thought of the result, it satisfied Anne, and she tripped gaily down the road, holding her ruddy head with its decoration of pink and yellow very proudly. When she reached Mrs. Lynde's house, she found that lady gone. Nothing daunted Anne. Nothing daunted, Anne proceeded onward to the church alone. In the porch she found a crowd of little girls, all more or less gaily attired in whites and blues and pinks, and all staring with curious eyes at the stranger in their midst, with her extraordinary head, ad with her extraordinary head adornment. Avonlea little girls had already heard queer stories about Anne. Mrs. Lynde said she had an awful temper. Jerry Butte, the hired boy at Green Gables, said she talked all the time to herself, or to the trees or flowers like a crazy girl. They looked at her and whispered to each other behind their quarterlies. Nobody made any friendly advances then or later on when the opening exercises were over, and Anne found herself in Mrs. Miss Rogerson's class. Miss Rogerson was a middle, middle-aged middle lady who had taught a Sunday school class for twenty years. Her method of teaching was to ask the printed questions from the quarterly and look sternly over its edge at the particular little girl she thought ought to answer the question. She looked often at Anne, and Anne, thanks to Marilla's drilling, answered promptly. Prop promptly. But it may be questioned if she understood very much about either question or answer. She did not think she liked Mrs. Rogerson. She felt very miserable. Every other little girl in class had puffed sleeves. Anne felt that life was really not worth living without puffed sleeves. Well, how did you like Sunday school? Marilla wanted to know when Anne came home. Her wreath having faded, Anne had discarded it in the lane, so Marilla was spared the knowledge of that for a time. I didn't like it a bit. It was horrid. Anne Shirley, said Marilla rebukingly. Anne sat down on the rocker with a long sigh, kissed one of Bonnie's leaves, and waved her hand to a blossoming fuchsia. They might have been lonesome while I was away, she explained. And now about the Sunday school. I behaved well, just as you told me Mrs. Lynde had gone, but I went right on myself. I went into the church with a lot of other little girls, and I sat in the corner of a pew by the window while the opening exercises went on. Mr. Bell made an awfully long prayer. I would have been dreadfully tired before he got through it if I hadn't been sitting by that window, and it looked right out on the lake of shining waters, so I just gazed at that and imagined all sorts of splendid things. You shouldn't have done anything of the sort. You should have listened to Mr. Bell. But he wasn't talking to me, protested Anne. He was talking to God, and he didn't seem to very, be very much interested in it either. I think he thought God was too far off to make it worthwhile. I said a little prayer myself, though. There was a long row of white birches hanging over the lake, and the sunshine, sunshine fell down through them way, way down deep into the water. Oh, Marilla, it was like a beautiful dream. It gave me a thrill, I just and I just said, thank you for it, God, two or three times. Not out loud, I hope, said Marilla anxiously. Oh, no, just under my breath. Well, Mr. Bell did get through at last, and they told me to go into the classroom with Miss Rogerson's class. There were nine other girls in it. They all had puffed sleeves. I tried to imagine mine were puffed, too, but I couldn't. Why couldn't I? It was as easy as could be to imagine they were puffed when I was alone in the East Gable, but it was awfully hard there among the others who really had, who really truly had puffed sleeves. You shouldn't have been thinking about your sleeves in Sunday school. You should have been attending to the lesson. I hope you knew it. Oh yes, I answered a lot of questions. Miss Rogerson asked ever so many. I don't think it was fair for her to do all the asking. There are lots of, 
There were lots I wanted to ask her, but I didn't like to because I didn't think she was a kindred spirit. Then all the other little girls recited a paraphrase. She asked me if I knew any. I told her I didn't, but I could recite The Dog at His Master's Grave if she liked. That's in the third royal, royal reader. It isn't a really truly religious piece of poetry, but it's so sad and melancholy that it might as well be. She said it wouldn't do, and she told me to learn the 19th paraphrase for next Sunday. I read it over in church afterward, and it's splendid. There are two lines in particular that just thrill me. Quick as the slaughtered squadrons fell in Midian's evil day. I don't know what squadrons mean, nor Midian either, but it sounds so tragical. I can hardly wait until next Sunday to recite it. I'll practice it all week. After Sunday school, I asked Mrs. Rogerson, because Mrs. Lynde was too far away, to show me your pew. I just sat as still as I could, and the text was Revelations, third chapter, second and third verses. It was a very long text. If I was a minister, I'd pick the short, snappy ones. The sermon was awfully long, too. I suppose the minister had to match it to the text. I didn't think he was a bit interesting. The trouble with him seems to be, be that he hasn't enough imagination. I didn't listen to him very much. I just let my thoughts run, and I thought of the most surprising things. Marilla felt helplessly that all this should be sternly reproved, but she was hampered by the undeniable fact that some of the things Anne had said, especially about the minister's sermons and Mr. Bell's prayers, were what she herself had really thought deep down in her heart for years, but had never given expression to. It almost seemed to her that those secret, ununtered, unuttered critical thoughts had suddenly taken visible and accusing shape and form in the person of this outspoken morsel of neglected humanity. That's all for today, friends. Have a good day.